Today, you're being bombarded with more and more ways for you to be separated from your hard-earned cash. Things like reverse mortgages and other products and services being marketed to seniors. Please stick around and we will talk about the ups and downs of these products and services. Forever Young would like to acknowledge the support of these sponsors. The Fun and Fitness Travel Club, which began at a neighborhood pool in Fairfax County, has become a nationwide travel club for active adults. Led by certified fitness instructors Jim Seeley and Cynthia New, this dues-free organization travels worldwide on cruises and land tours, offering members free daily exercise classes in water aerobics, tai chi, yoga, deck walking, ballroom dancing, and sing-alongs. The website is fun-fitness.com and the phone number is 703 8270414 You make me feel so young You make me feel like spring sprung Every time I see you grin I'm such a happy individual The moment that you speak I want to run play hide and seek I want to go and bounce the moon Just like a big balloon seems that you can't open up your newspapers or turn on the television without being bombarded by reversible mortgages and other products and services marketed to seniors. Today on Forever Young, we will be talking to someone who will tell us the whole story behind these different uh, products and services marketed to seniors. Welcome, Ms. Lee Cutler. Thank you, Jim. It's wonderful to be here. Nice to have you on our show. Lee teaches groups of seniors at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University, at Holland Hall Senior Center, and other venues. So nice to have you back with us. Now, let's start and talk about reverse mortgages. Uh, it just seems like 24-7 uh, on the television and also in a lot of different newspapers that are geared towards seniors, we are hearing about these enticing commercials uh, about reverse mortgages. What, what's, what's that all about? Well, it's, it's interesting to see how much money and how much time is spent on marketing these products to people. And it's interesting to see what the type of marketing in, is in that they, they tout the features, how wonderful it is to tap money out of your home. And we've been hearing that for years and years with lines of credit, home equity lines of credit, pay off your credit cards, uh, cut down your debt, make yourself you know, more secure. Well, what, what this is, is, is rather than a regular mortgage where you borrow a sum of money and you spend time over the years paying it down, you borrow a sum of money, all right, but the debt increases rather than decreases. And one of the things I like to say to people is let's try and simplify this. Let's try and understand the language and make it as simple as possible. Um, these, these things are not necessarily investments or financial they're financial products, but they're not investment related. Um, they're products and they have uh, wrappers and packaging, just like a box of cereal has a package and a box and uh, in a liner, and then you buy the cereal. What are you actually buying here? You're taking money that's in your under your control in your home, and you're taking that money out of the out of your home, and you're borrowing the money but you don't have to pay it back, or so they say, and you don't have to leave your home. But that doesn't mean that the debt isn't growing. The debt continues to grow. In a reverse mortgage, you increase the debt over time, and what that does is it drains the equity in your house. For instance, if this is your house, and this is the equity that you've built over the 30 years that you paid it off, plus the uh, capital increase that it's, that it's also experienced over those 30 years, what you're doing now is you're taking the equity out of your house. And with the reverse mortgage, there's so much you can take out of the house because you have the bank who's calculated what they want their profit to be, and you have actuaries who calculate how long you're going to live, so therefore how much of it they want you to take out or are going to allow you to take out. And then you have the government in there who puts some controls over it to make sure that it's not totally um, uh, going to bankrupt you. For instance, the bank might loan you a third of the value of your house depending on your age. <clears throat> okay, so you take a third of the, the value of your house and you get to spend that. You can buy a cruise with that. Now, do you get a lump, that in a lump sum? It's or? your choice. Okay. You can either get it in a lump sum or you can get it in a series of payments. Lump, kind of and, like a lottery payment. You can either right, get the whole thing at once right. or in the lot. Right. And you can increase your lifestyle with this. You can mm -hmm. go on a cruise. You can pay off debts. You can do whatever you like with it. But it's depleted the 
the, 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 the asset value of your house. But after you've enjoyed this, or while you're enjoying this, you have to understand that the bank that's allowed you to do this is also taking their percentage rate. Right, so it's whittling away the value. So it's also whittling away the value. Mm -hmm. And another aspect of it, or at least the contracts that I've reviewed, and I can't say they're all like this, is that the, the rate of interest that's charged is not like the rate of interest on a regular mortgage where it's an annual rate or it fluctuates maybe a few times during the year with the cap. My understanding is, is the rate can fluctuate much more dramatically, such as on a monthly basis. So month to month, your interest could be 5% to 7% to 9% and back to 7%. And at those rates, the equity that's being eaten up in your house can be quickly depleted to the point where the pile that the bank gets is significantly larger than the pile that you got and have already spent. And one of the key things that you should ask yourself when considering this is, why do I want to take this money? Why do I want to build this debt and diminish the equity that I have in my assets? And also, would it be better to get a home equity loan versus a reverse mortgage? Well, you have to look at the mechanics of the loan. You have to look at the rates. Now, with a home equity loan, you do have to pay it back. So you'll have to pay you know, with the money that you've used, you'd have to make payments to pay, the, pay it back to build your equity back up. The enticing thing, or the way they make this enticing, is that you can take the money, you never have to pay it back. But what they fail to tell you, or what they fail to make you consider, is that why would you take that money? Have you made foolish decisions? Are your personal finances in disarray? Is giving you that money going to solve your personal habits? Because once that money's gone, you're in worse financial shape than you were before you touched it. Right, and then there's the implications of what are you going to be able to leave to your heirs, your children and grandchildren. Exactly. And the idea that the appreciation rate of your home, okay, will be more than the interest that you're paying on the accrued debt is probably not practical. Because the debt is changing, or the, the, the rate of the debt is changing month to month. Now, this goes back to something we talked about in another uh, program where you appeared, where these contracts often differ quite a lot from what the salesperson is presenting. And that's just a larger issue. Now we're looking at a more fine. So a salesperson can come at you and say, oh, you're going to have thousands of dollars, in some cases tens of thousands of dollars, to just have a great time and do whatever you want, and you'll never have to pay it back. And what you're telling us is that there is a very big downside that people need to consider. The difference between the features and the contract is immense. If you don't understand the contract and you simply believe the features, then when all of your equity is gone, all right, all of it's gone, and you're down to nothing. Especially with people living now into their 90s, and even uh, you read about people who are living well over 100 years old, uh, then that could very well happen. Well, yeah, we're also bombarded with information on other products, such as long-term care products, and what's going to happen when you get older and you need help taking care of yourself. And a lot of us have the equity in our home as something to fall back on if we need a cushion for the future. Now, the promise of these is you don't have to leave your home until you're ready to, but what, under what conditions would you leave your home? And if you left your home, um, what needs might you have? And if there's no further equity in your house and you do have to leave your home and go elsewhere, unless you go into a family member's home or something, you have to consider the cost and the overhead of that. Where is that going to come from? And uh, what are the kind of government <coughs> regulations that are in place for these reverse mortgages? Well, I did one myself, which is what I generally do. When one of these products comes out, I'll, I'll make contact with the rep and I'll, I'll ask for myself, although I'm not quite old enough to qualify. A few years from now, I okay, would be. Okay, now that's a good point. How old do you have to be to qualify for They want you mortgage? to be 62 years old, the contracts that I've seen so far. Mm -hmm. Okay, they want you to be a certain age, uh, and the actuaries that they have working for them calculate how long you're going to live. And then they, they compare that to the, the value of your house, the assessed value of your house. Mm -hmm. uh, so they or take into account, like, are you a smoker or a non-smoker, or is it just a general uh, table? I don't know how, how complicated mm -hmm. the actual um, application is, to okay. tell you the truth. I don't recall that. 
but I was told that you know at at 62 the amount of money I could take out of my home for me I thought was fairly neg negligible it was a little over a hundred thousand dollars you know and and that could be spent very quickly and then you have a hundred thousand dollars in debt okay growing at five six seven so percent debt continues to grow the debt continues to grow mm -hmm. your taxes continue to increase mm -hmm. your expenses continue to increase and and I, I would say that if you're looking at one of these you probably have a money management issue that you need to deal with before you go forward with this because this is going to be a short-term fix and this growing debt is going to be a long-term problem. Right, so this is a quick fix that may bring more problems than it's worth. Yes. All right, well, another one of the products and services that are being marketed to seniors are joint reversible living trusts. Well, let's, let's put all of our equity yeah. back in the same <laughs> pot again. All right. right. <laughs> uh, looking at the difference between investments and products, um, uh, legal products, financial products, investment oriented products they all have a certain amount of packaging with them uh, this money has the silver coins or the, 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 the gold is packaging the, the netting is packaging and they're in this package now the chocolate itself you know is inside of this package which is inside of this package which is inside of this package and what is the real value um, the idea of trust I guess goes back to ancient times when uh, we lived in a feudal system and uh, the, uh, the rulers allowed the knights to use the property for taxes and somehow they came up with an idea where they didn't have to get out and fight the wars themselves but they could somehow find a contract that would allow them to avoid the taxes and still have the benefit of the property. <clears throat> my understanding and I'm a layman and I only speak according to my own experience and I try to stay up on these things and do a lot of reading is that um, the idea of a, 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 a trust and we're talking about uh, um, the joint revocable, the joint revocable trust. Living trust right uh, the idea is that if you if you take your assets and, and these are these are Jim's assets and my assets as a couple and uh, we've built them together and we can both use them and share them um, and however if we put them in a trust together and we gave them to the trust um, we would still have control over them. However, if something happened to me, um, the idea is that Jim would take all of his assets and then divide them in two. So one trust would become two trusts. And this trust, Jim would have total control over, could spend any way he wished, but this trust would come, up, come under a separate contract. All right? and, and what are the rules of that contract? Again, getting back to the idea that you have to really understand the contract because a contract puts restrictions around anything that it's concerned with. A contract on your house, a contract on your money, a contract on your assets. So we now have what was our assets. Something happened to me. They were all Jim's assets. Now they're divided into two contracts, and this contract is more restrictive than this contract. This contract has uh, clauses in it that may give other people, trustees, uh, the ability to question what you do with this half of what was your money. So, you know, I just advise people to make absolutely sure they understand what the restrictions are and the fact that they may be losing some control. Um, the features that are touted are, are, well, you're better protected, your, your heirs are better protected, there, there are areas of protection that you would gain from doing this, but there are also areas that might not fit your needs given certain circumstances. So continuing to talk about these joint revocable living trusts, what are some other considerations, and especially uh, government and tax uh, considerations people should be thinking about? Well, again, I just speak from my personal experience, and I don't speak as an authority. I'm certainly not a legal expert, um, and I speak from uh, my reading and my interface with people and what I know. And your teaching. And my teaching, locations. yes. Um, and and these, these trusts, as I understand it, are largely uh, sold as tax saving vehicles and taxes have become so complicated these days because one year we can give our children this amount the next year we can give them this amount and supposedly in the next few years that amount will revert back to a previous amount so it's a constantly changing 
uh, arena of, of how taxes uh, are arranged and what we can do. And that is uh, good fodder for people who sell tax-saving devices, a la legal contracts and such, to keep us always wondering what's going to happen next and how can we prepare ourselves and protect ourselves. And I like to try to keep things as simple as possible when talking to people. And in this situation, one of the things that I would ask if I were considering this is, what is the ongoing cost of keeping these contracts current? If I initiate a, uh, a, a trust, a, a joint uh, trust with my spouse, and the tax has changed unexpectedly three years, I'll have to realign that, and I'll have to go back to my attorney, and I'll have to have it readjusted. And what could be the ongoing costs of these? There are costs setting it up, and there are costs to keep it right, current. Right, because the attorneys could be charging hundreds of dollars an hour to kind of update these contracts. Um, yes. We live in a fee-based environment, unfortunately, and we call it consumer-based, but the reality is that our money is used to purchase services and products that continually generate fees tax planning, estate planning, long-term care planning, all of these things unfortunately cause us to come in contact with products and services that continually generate fees. And if uh, making a change like using this kind of trust generates hundreds of dollars a year in fees that you hadn't paid before, you have to make that a consideration. It says, is this what I want to do? Does the protection that they tell me it offers in all of these different areas necessarily meet with my needs? Because sometimes the Band-Aid may be too big for the tiny little wound that may never happen. Right, and that's something we've talked about on previous episodes of Forever Young, is that uh, the person trying to sell you these products and services is oftentimes presenting the base fee and not really mentioning these auxiliary charges that kind of come out of nowhere seemingly. Well, unfortunately, you never know until you sign on the dotted line, and then you have to figure it out as you go because there are surprise charges. And everybody is motivated, you know, uh, unfortunately on some level to convince you of, of what their objective is, whether mm -hmm. it's somebody selling a tax planning uh, a product or, or any other kind of a product, a used car, you know. They're not going to tell you all the negatives. They're going to tell you the information that's going to get you to move in the direction they'd like you to, mm -hmm. which is to buy the car. Right. And One of our uh, viewers who knew that you were going to be on our show again uh, emailed me a question that I like to read mm -hmm. uh, that she wanted you to address. What happens when everything is in right of survivorship and one spouse becomes incompetent? Where, who's, who has the right of decision? Okay, well, I would say let's slow down and think about that for a minute uh, or two. Okay, if, if a spouse becomes incompetent, if your spouse has an accident or has, um, uh, becomes incompetent because of dementia that worsens, in, worsens over time, um, uh, unless there's a, there, the court is involved and, 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 and that person has been declared incompetent and guardianship, the guardianship process has gone through, um, you know, there, there's, there's no point in time that says, um, well, my, my husband's incompetent, therefore he can't, he can't use his judgment on any level. Um, in, in, in my case, as for, if, 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 a matter of example, my, my husband uh, had uh, some cognitive issues before he died, and he slowly lost some capacity. But there was, you know, not necessarily a point in time where I lost my right and he lost his ability to help me make decisions. Ultimately, there was a guardianship um, issue that came up, but we were able to put things in play well before that. Um, if, if you haven't been able to do that, um, oftentimes you can get locked into having to go to the court because the court's already been involved and there's been a declaration that this person can no longer make decisions and it complicates things. Right, because uh, then it becomes who's making the decisions. Is, are the doctors making the decisions? Are the adult children making the decision? Is the spouse making the decision? Well, oftentimes that could back up to the point where the court's making the decision. Um, and, and a trust is a potential vehicle, okay? However, you have to say what's the cost of the trust, what are the ongoing expenses, and how real a problem is this? You know, if my spouse starts to diminish in capacity, we can still make plans and he can still legally participate until there's been perhaps a court determination, and that may very well be well after, you know, the point that you can still make the decisions together. 
All right. Anything else about uh, joint revocable living trust that you'd like to share with our viewers? I would just like to say that, you know, try to make sure that you understand all the elements of it and, and don't find yourself motivated by the fear of not doing it. Right, and something we talked about the last time you were on it, the idea that if somebody shoves a contract under your nose and says, well, this is just a formality, just sign here, what you <coughs> recommended to our viewers is say, I need to take this contract home with me, I want to show it to some trusted people, and then I will come back next week or whenever when I've decided if this is something I really want to do. You may have to live with the consequences of that contract for the rest of your life. Now, another thing we keep hearing about are... Uh, pre-planning funerals and what's come out fairly recently in the news is at least one case where people who thought that they had pretty much planned their funeral and pretty much taken care of all the expenses turned out they had actually uh, been ripped off by this, this person. What are some ramifications and considerations that people should uh, take into account when doing any of this pre-need planning we keep hearing about? Well, I think all of this is similar because all of it is referring to trying to capture and protect yourself against something you haven't actually experienced mm -hmm. yet. Um, trying to capture uh, possibilities in a trust, trying to capture all the possibilities, you know, in, in funeral pre-planning when you haven't been through the process yet and you don't know where all the extra costs might be or what can be left out. Um, you don't have any frame of reference. Now, maybe if you've been to, you know, been through two or three family funerals, you might have a better ability to see if this particular contract covers everything that should be covered. But if you haven't been through it again, there's so many peripheral expenses and peripheral things attached to funerals. And, and, and what you don't know is if, you know, if, if you sign a contract, you don't know about contract obsolescence. The, the industry changes, the technology changes. We may, we may deal with burying people so much differently in the future than we're dealing with today. And there may be a whole different technology or procedure for it that your, your contract today is, is, is not applicable to. Right, and then there's other uh, considerations <clears throat> like inflation. Yes. And uh, that's where it goes back to what we were talking about, the importance of looking at that contract. Does that contract protect you from inflation, or are you signing something now in today's dollars that, you know, and, and these funeral costs keep going up even hot, faster than the rate of inflation. So what are those ramifications? Well, it, it, it's, it, what she's saying is very interesting. It's like, um, today I'm going to give you money and I'm going to buy a coupon for 10% off of Campbell's Soup tomorrow. Or I'm going to buy a, t a coupon that's good for 10 cents off of Campbell's Soup tomorrow. Well, one protects you if it's if it's 10%, you're protected because as the cost of the product rises, your percentage remains the same. But if you buy a 10 cent coupon off of a product and there's no protection of price, okay, your 10 cents is virtually worthless. Yeah, because they could raise the price 20 cents. Exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. Kind of a gotcha thing. Exactly, and that ties into the inflation protection factor with some of these insurance products are out there that are out there. They don't necessarily protect you against the rising cost of the product or the service that you think they do. All right. Well, that's terrific. Well, I'm sorry we're out of time, Lee. Thank you so Thank much you. for uh, joining us again today. Lee actually teaches classes of uh, much longer duration that get even deeper into these topics at uh, local venues such as the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University, the Holland Hall Senior Center, and other venues. So please visit our website, foreveryoungtv.org, to learn more about these topics and all of the featured guests and topics that we always feature on Forever Young every week.
production facilities provided by Fairfax Public Access, Fairfax, Virginia.